Part five of the Island of Doctor Moreau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirteen. A parley. I turned again and went on down towards the sea. I found the hot stream broadened out to a shallow, weedy sand, in which an abundance of crabs and long-bodied, many-legged creatures started from my footfall. I walked to the very edge of the salt water, and then I felt I was safe. I turned and stared, arms akimbo, at the thick green behind me, into which the steamy ravine cut like a smoking gash. But, as I say, I was too full of excitement, and, a true saying, though those who have never known danger may doubt it, too desperate to die. Then it came into my head that there was one chance before me yet. While Moreau and Montgomery and their bestial rabble chased me through the island, might I not go round the beach until I came to their enclosure, make a flank march upon them, in fact, and then, with a rock lugged out of their loosely built wall, perhaps, smash in the lock of the smaller door, and see what I could find, knife, pistol, or what not, to fight them with when they returned. It was, at any rate, something to try. So I turned to the westward, and walked along by the water's edge. The setting sun flashed his blinding heat into my eyes. The slight Pacific tide was running in with a gentle ripple. Presently the shore fell away southward, and the sun came round upon my right hand. Then, suddenly, far in front of me, I saw first one and then several figures emerging from the bushes, Moreau with his grey staghound, then Montgomery, and two others. At that I stopped. They saw me, and began gesticulating and advancing. I stood watching them approach. The two beast-men came running forward to cut me off from the undergrowth, inland. Montgomery came, running also, but straight towards me. Moreau followed slower with his dog. At last I roused myself from my inaction, and, turning seaward, walked straight into the water. The water was very shallow at first. I was thirty yards out before the waves reached my waist. Dimly, I could see the intertidal creatures darting away from my feet. "'What are you doing, man?' cried Montgomery. I turned, standing waist-deep, and stared at them. Montgomery stood panting at the margin of the water. His face was bright red with exertion, his long flaxen hair blown about his head, and his dropping nether lip showed his irregular teeth. Moreau was just coming up, his face pale and firm and the dog at his hand barked at me. Both men had heavy whips. Farther up the beach stared the beast-men. "'What am I doing? I'm going to drown myself,' said I. Montgomery and Moreau looked at each other. "'Why?' asked Moreau. "'Because that is better than being tortured by you.' "'I told you so,' said Montgomery, and Moreau said something in a low tone. "'What makes you think I shall torture you?' asked Moreau. "'What I saw,' I said, "'and those yonder.' "'Hush!' said Moreau, and held up his hand. "'I will not,' said I. "'They were men. What are they now? I, at least, will not be like them.' I looked past my interlocutors. Up the beach were Emling, Montgomery's attendant, and one of the white-swathed brutes from the boat. Farther up, in the shadow of the trees, I saw my little ape-man, and behind him some other dim figures. "'Who are these creatures?' said I, pointing to them, and raising my voice more and more that it might reach them. "'They were men, men like yourselves, whom you have infected with some bestial taint, men whom you have enslaved, and whom you still fear.' "'You who listen!' I cried, pointing now to Moreau, and shouting past him to the beast-men. "'You who listen! Do you not see these men still fear you, go in dread of you? Why, then, do you fear them? You are many!' "'For God's sake!' cried Montgomery. "'Stop that, Prendick!' "'Prendick!' cried Moreau. 
They both shouted together as if to drown my voice, and behind them lowered the staring faces of the beast-men, wondering, their deformed hands hanging down, their shoulders hunched up. They seemed, as I fancied, to be trying to understand me, to remember, I thought, something of their human past. I went on shouting. I scarcely remember what. That Moreau and Montgomery could be killed, that they were not to be feared. That was the burden of what I put into the heads of the beast people. I saw the green-eyed man in the dark rags, who had met me on the evening of my arrival, come out from among the trees, and others followed him, to hear me better. At last, for want of breath, I paused. "'Listen to me for a moment,' said the steady voice of Moreau, "'and then say what you will.' "'Well?' said I. He coughed, thought, then shouted, "'Latin, Prendick, bad Latin, schoolboy Latin, but try and understand. He known sunt homines, sunt animalia, qui nos habemus vivisected. A humanizing process. I will explain. Come ashore. I laughed. A pretty story, said I. They talk, build houses. They were men. It's likely I'll come ashore. The water just beyond where you stand is deep and full of sharks. That's my way, said I, short and sharp, presently. Wait a minute. He took something out of his pocket that flashed back the sun, and dropped the object at his feet. That's a loaded revolver, said he. Montgomery here will do the same. Now. We are going up the beach until you are satisfied the distance is safe. Then come and take the revolvers. Not I. You have a third between you. I want you to think over things, Prendick. In the first place, I never asked you to come upon this island. If we vivisected men, we should import men, not beasts. In the next, we had you drugged last night, had we wanted to work you any mischief. And in the next, now your first panic is over, and you can think a little, is Montgomery here quite up to the character you give him? We have chased you for your good, because this island is full of inimical phenomena. Besides, why should we want to shoot you when you have just offered to drown yourself? Why did you set your people on to me when I was in the hut? We felt sure of catching you and bringing you out of danger. Afterwards we drew away from the scent for your good. I mused. It seemed just possible. Then I remembered something again. But I saw, said I, in the enclosure. That was a puma. "'Look here, Prendick,' said Montgomery. "'You're a silly ass. Come out of the water and take these revolvers and talk. We can't do anything more than we could do now. I will confess that then, and indeed always, I distrusted and dreaded Moreau. But Montgomery was a man I felt I understood. "'Go up the beach,' said I, after thinking, and added, "'Holding your hands up. Can't do that.' said Montgomery, with an explanatory nod over his shoulder, undignified. "'Go up to the trees, then,' said I, "'as you please.' "'It's a damned silly ceremony,' said Montgomery. Both turned and faced the six or seven grotesque creatures who stood there in the sunlight, solid, casting shadows, moving, and yet so incredibly unreal. Montgomery cracked his whip at them, and forthwith they all turned and fled helter-skelter into the trees, and when Montgomery and Moreau were at a distance I judged sufficient, I waded ashore, and picked up and examined the revolvers. To satisfy myself against the subtlest trickery, I discharged one at a round lump of lava, and had the satisfaction of seeing the stone pulverized and the beach splashed with lead. Still I hesitated for a moment. "'I'll take the risk,' said I, at last, and with a revolver in each hand I walked up the beach towards them. "'That's better,' said Moreau, without affectation. 
"'As it is, you have wasted the best part of my day with your confounded imagination, and, with a touch of contempt which humiliated me, he and Montgomery turned and went on in silence before me. The knot of beastmen, still wondering, stood back among the trees. I passed them as serenely as possible. One started to follow me, but retreated again when Montgomery cracked his whip. The rest stood silent, watching. They may once have been animals, but I never before saw an animal trying to think. Chapter 14 Dr. Moreau Explains "'And now, Prendick, I will explain,' said Dr. Moreau, so soon as we had eaten and drunk. I must confess that you are the most dictatorial guest I ever entertained. I warn you that this is the last I shall do to oblige you. The next thing you threaten to commit suicide about, I shan't do, even at some personal inconvenience. He sat in my deck-chair, a cigar half-consumed in his white dexterous-looking fingers. The light of the swinging lamp fell on his white hair. He stared through the little window out at the starlight. I sat as far away from him as possible, the table between us and the revolvers to hand. Montgomery was not present. I did not care to be with the two of them in such a little room. You admit that the vivisected human being, as you called it, is, after all, only a puma? said Moreau. He had made me visit that horror in the inner room to assure myself of its inhumanity. "'It is the puma,' I said, still alive, but so cut and mutilated, as I pray I may never see living flesh again. "'Of all vile—' "'Never mind that,' said Moreau. "'At least spare me those youthful horrors. "'Montgomery used to be just the same. "'You admit that it is the puma.' Now be quiet, while I reel off my physiological lecture, and forthwith, beginning in the tone of a man supremely bored, but presently warming a little, he explained his work to me. It was very simple and convincing. Now and then there was a touch of sarcasm in his voice. Presently I found myself hot with shame at our mutual positions. The creatures I had seen were not men, had never been men. They were animals, humanized animals, triumphs of vivisection. You forget all that a skilled vivisector can do with living things, said Moreau. For my own part, I'm puzzled why the things I have done here have not been done before. Small efforts, of course, have been made. Amputation, tongue-cutting, excisions— of course, you know a squint may be induced or cured by surgery. Then, in the course of excisions, you have all kinds of secondary changes, pigmentary disturbances, modifications of the passions, alterations in the secretion of fatty tissue. I have no doubt you have heard of these things. Of course, said I. But these foul creatures of yours, all in good time, said he, waving his hand at me. I am only beginning. Those are trivial cases of alteration. Surgery can do better things than that. There is building up as well as breaking down and changing. You have heard, perhaps, of a common surgical operation resorted to in cases where the nose has been destroyed. A flap of skin is cut from the forehead, turned down on the nose, and heals in the new position. This is a kind of grafting in a new position of part of an animal upon itself. Grafting of freshly obtained material from another animal is also possible. The case of teeth, for example. The grafting of skin and bone is done to facilitate healing. The surgeon places in the middle of the wound pieces of skin snipped from another animal, or fragments of bone from a victim freshly killed. Hunter's cockspur— possibly you have heard of that, flourished on the bull's neck, and the rhinoceros rats of the Algerian zoaves are also to be thought of, monsters manufactured by transferring a slip from the tail of an ordinary rat to its snout, 
and allowing it to heal in that position. "'Monsters manufactured?' said I. "'Then you mean to tell me, yes, these creatures you have seen are animals, carven and wrought into new shapes. To that, to the study of the plasticity of living forms, my life has been devoted. I have studied for years, gaining in knowledge as I go. I see you look horrified, and yet I am telling you nothing new. It all lay in the surface of practical anatomy years ago, but no one had the temerity to touch it. It is not simply the outward form of an animal which I can change. The physiology, the chemical rhythm of the creature, may also be made to undergo an enduring modification, of which vaccination and other methods of inoculation with living or dead matter are examples that will no doubt be familiar to you. A similar operation is the transfusion of blood, with which subject indeed I began. These are all familiar cases. Less so, and probably far more extensive, were the operations of those medieval practitioners who made dwarfs and beggar cripples show monsters, some vestiges of whose art still remain in the preliminary manipulation of the young mountebank or contortionist. Victor Hugo gives an account of them in L'Homme qui rit. But perhaps my meaning grows plain now. You begin to see that it is a possible thing to transplant tissue from one part of an animal to another, or from one animal to another. To alter its chemical reactions and methods of growth, to modify the articulations of its limbs, and indeed to change it in its most intimate structure. And yet this extraordinary branch of knowledge has never been sought as an end and systematically by modern investigators until I took it up. Some such things have been hit upon in the last resort of surgery. Most of the kindred evidence that will recur to your mind has been demonstrated as it were by accidents, by tyrants, by criminals, by the breeders of horses and dogs, by all kinds of untrained, clumsy-handed men working for their own immediate ends. I was the first man to take up this question armed with antiseptic surgery, and with a really scientific knowledge of the laws of growth. Yet one would imagine it must have been practiced in secret before. Such creatures as the Siamese twins, and in the vaults of the Inquisition, no doubt their chief aim was artistic torture, but some, at least, of the inquisitors must have had a touch of scientific curiosity. But, said I, these things, these animals, talk. He said that was so, and proceeded to point out that the possibility of vivisection does not stop at a mere physical metamorphosis. A pig may be educated. The mental structure is even less determinate than the bodily. In our growing science of hypnotism we find the promise of a possibility of superseding old inherent instincts by new suggestions, grafting upon or replacing the inherited fixed ideas. Very much, indeed, of what we call moral education, he said, is such an artificial modification and perversion of instinct. Pugnacity is trained into courageous self-sacrifice, and suppressed sexuality into religious emotion. And the great difference between man and monkey is in the larynx, he continued, in the incapacity to frame delicately different sound symbols by which thought could be sustained. In this I failed to agree with him, but with a certain incivility he declined to notice my objection. He repeated that the thing was so, and continued his account of his work. I asked him why he had taken the human form as a model. There seemed to me then, and there still seems to me now, a strange wickedness for that choice. He confessed that he had chosen that form by chance. I might just as well have worked to form sheep into llamas and llamas into sheep. I suppose there is something in the human form that appeals to the artistic turn of mind more powerfully than any animal shape can. But I've not confined myself to man-making. 
Once or twice he was silent, for a minute, perhaps. These years, how they have slipped by! And here I have wasted a day saving your life, and am now wasting an hour explaining myself. But, said I, I still do not understand. Where is your justification for inflicting all this pain? The only thing that could excuse vivisection to me would be some application precisely said he but you see i am differently constituted we are on different platforms you are a materialist i am not a materialist i began hotly in my view in my view for it is just this question of pain that parts us so long as visible or audible pain turns you sick so long as your own pains drive you so long as pain underlies your propositions about sin, so long, I tell you, you are an animal, thinking a little less obscurely what an animal feels. This pain, I gave an impatient shrug at such sophistry. Oh, but it is such a little thing. A mind truly open to what science has to teach must see that it is a little thing. It may be that, save in this little planet, this speck of cosmic dust, invisible long before the nearest star could be attained, it may be, I say, that nowhere else does this thing called pain occur. But the laws we feel our way towards, why, even on this earth, even among living things, what pain is there? As he spoke, he drew a little penknife from his pocket, opened the smaller blade, and moved his chair so that I could see his thigh. Then, choosing the place deliberately, he drove the blade into his leg and withdrew it. No doubt, he said, you have seen that before. It does not hurt a pinprick. But what does it show? The capacity for pain is not needed in the muscle, and it is not placed there, it is but little needed in the skin and only here and there over the thigh is a spot capable of feeling pain. Pain is simply our intrinsic medical adviser to warn us and stimulate us. Not all living flesh is painful, nor is all nerve, not even our sensory nerve. There's no taint of pain, real pain, in the sensations of the optic nerve. If you wound the optic nerve, you merely see flashes of light, just as disease of the auditory nerve merely means a humming in our ears. Plants do not feel pain, nor the lower animals. It's possible that such animals as the starfish and crayfish do not feel pain at all. Then, with men, the more intelligent they become, the more intelligently they will see after their own welfare, and the less they will need the goad to keep them out of danger. I never yet heard of a useless thing that was not ground out of existence by evolution sooner or later. The dew and pain gets needless. Then I am a religious man, Prendick, as every sane man must be. It may be, I fancy, that I have seen more of the ways of this world's maker than you, for I have sought his laws, in my way, all my life while you, I understand, have been collecting butterflies. And, I tell you, pleasure and pain have nothing to do with heaven or hell. Pleasure and pain, bah! What is your theologian's ecstasy but Mohammed's Uri in the dark? This store which men and women set on pleasure and pain, Prendick, is the mark of the beast upon them the mark of the beast from which they came. Pain, pain and pleasure, they are for us only so long as we wriggle in the dust. You see, I went on with this research just the way it led me. That is the only way I ever heard of true research going. I asked a question, devised some method of obtaining an answer, and got a fresh question. Was this possible or that possible? You cannot imagine what this means to an investigator, what an intellectual passion grows upon him. You cannot imagine the strange, colourless delight of these intellectual desires. The thing before you is no longer an animal, a fellow-creature, but a problem. 
Sympathetic pain, all I know of it, I remember as a thing I used to suffer from years ago. I wanted, it was the one thing I wanted, to find out the extreme limit of plasticity in a living shape. But, said I, the thing is an abomination. To this day I have never troubled about the ethics of the matter, he continued. The study of nature makes a man at last as remorseless as nature. I have gone on, not heeding anything but the question I was pursuing, and the material has dripped into the huts yonder. It is nearly eleven years since we came here, I and Montgomery and six Kanakas. I remember the green stillness of the island and the empty ocean about us as though it was yesterday. The place seemed waiting for me. The stores were landed, and the house was built. The Kanakas founded some huts near the ravine. I went to work here upon what I had brought with me. There were some disagreeable things happened at first. I began with a sheep, and killed it, after a day and a half, by a slip of the scalpel. I took another sheep, and made a thing of pain and fear, and left it bound up to heel. It looked quite human to me when I had finished it, but when I went to it I was discontented with it. It remembered me, and was terrified beyond imagination, and it had no more than the wits of a sheep. The more I looked at it, the clumsier it seemed, until at last I put the monster out of its misery. These animals without courage, these fear-haunted, pain-driven things, without a spark of pugnacious energy to face torment, they are no good for man-making. Then I took a gorilla I had, and upon that, working with infinite care and mastering difficulty after difficulty, I made my first man. All the week, night and day, I moulded him. With him, it was chiefly the brain that needed moulding. Much had to be added, much changed. I thought him a fair specimen of the negroid type when I had finished him, and he lay bandaged, bowed, and motionless before me. It was only when his life was assured that I left him, and came into this room again, and found Montgomery much as you are. He had heard some of the cries as the thing grew human, cries like those that disturbed you so. I didn't take him into my confidence at first, and the Kanakas, too, had realized something of it. They were scared out of their wits by the sight of me. I got Montgomery over to me, in a way, but I and he had the hardest job to prevent the Kanakas deserting. Finally they did, and so we lost the yacht. I spent many days educating the brute. Altogether I had him for three or four months. I taught him the rudiments of English, gave him ideas of counting, even made the thing read the alphabet. But at that he was slow, though I've met with idiots slower. He began with a clean sheet mentally, had no memories left in his mind of what he had been. When his scars were quite healed, and he was no longer anything but painful and stiff, and able to converse a little, I took him yonder and introduced him to the Kanakas as an interesting stowaway. They were horribly afraid of him at first, somehow, which offended me, rather, for I was conceited about him. But his ways seemed so mild, and he was so abject, that after a time they received him and took his education in hand. He was quick to learn, very imitative and adaptive, and built himself a hovel rather better, it seemed to me, than their own shanties. There was one among the boys a bit of a missionary, and he taught the thing to read, or at least to pick out letters, and gave him some rudimentary ideas of morality. But, it seems, the beast's habits were not all that is desirable. I rested from work for some days after this, and was in a mind to write an account of the whole affair, to wake up English physiology. Then I came upon the creature squatting up in a tree, and gibbering at two of the Kanakas who had been teasing him. I threatened him, told him the inhumanity of such a proceeding, aroused his sense of shame, and came home resolved to do better before I took my work back to England. I have been doing better. 
but somehow the things drift back again. The stubborn beast flesh grows day by day back again. But I mean to do better things still. I mean to conquer that. This puma. But that's the story. All the Kanaka boys are dead now. One fell overboard of the launch, and one died of a wounded heel that he poisoned in some way with plant juice. Three went away in the yacht, and, I suppose, and hope, were drowned. The other one was killed. Well, I have replaced them. Montgomery went on much as you are disposed to do at first, and then— What became of the other one? said I, sharply. The other Kanaka who was killed. The fact is, after I had made a number of human creatures, I made a thing. He hesitated. Yes, said I. It was killed. I don't understand, said I. Do you mean to say it killed the Kanakais? It killed several other things that it caught. We chased it for a couple of days. It only got loose by accident, never meant it to get away. It wasn't finished. It was purely an experiment. It was a limbless thing with a horrible face that writhed along the ground in a serpentine fashion. It was immensely strong, and in infuriating pain. It lurked in the woods for some days, until we hunted it. And then it wriggled into the northern part of the island, and we divided the party to close in upon it. Montgomery insisted upon coming with me. The man had a rifle, and when his body was found, one of the barrels was curved into the shape of an S, and very nearly bitten through. Montgomery shot the thing. After that I stuck to the ideal of humanity, except for little things. He became silent. I sat in silence, watching his face. So, for twenty years altogether, counting nine years in England, I have been going on, and there is still something in everything I do that defeats me, makes me dissatisfied, challenges me to further effort. Sometimes I rise above my level, sometimes I fall below it, but always I fall short of the things I dream. The human shape I can get now, almost with ease, so that it is lithe and graceful, or thick and strong. But often there is trouble with the hands and the claws, painful things that I dare not shape too freely. But it is in the subtle grafting and reshaping one must needs do to the brain that my trouble lies. The intelligence is often oddly low, with unaccountable blank ends, unexpected gaps. And least satisfactory of all is something that I cannot touch somewhere. I cannot determine wherein the seat of the emotions. Cravings, instincts, desires that harm humanity, a strange hidden reservoir to burst forth suddenly and inundate the whole being of the creature with anger, hate, or fear. These creatures of mine seemed strange and uncanny to you so soon as you began to observe them. But to me, just after I make them, they seem to be indisputably human beings. It's afterwards, as I observe them, that the persuasion fades. First one animal trait, then another, creeps to the surface and stares out at me. But I will conquer yet. Each time I dip a living creature into the bath of burning pain, I say, this time I will burn out all the animal. This time I will make a rational creature of my own. After all, what is ten years? Men have been a hundred thousand in the making, he thought darkly. But I am drawing near the fastness. This puma of mine, after a silence, and they revert. As soon as my hand is taken from them, the beast begins to creep back, begins to assert itself again. Another long silence. Then you take the things you make into those dens, said I. They go. I turn them out when I begin to feel the beast in them. Presently they wander there. They all dread this house and me. There is a kind of travesty of humanity over there. Montgomery knows about it, for he interferes in their affairs. 
He has trained one or two of them to our service. He's ashamed of it, but I believe he half likes some of those beasts. It's his business, not mine. They only sicken me with a sense of failure. I take no interest in them. I fancy they follow in the lines the Kanaka missionary marked out, and have a kind of mockery of a rational life, poor beasts. There's something they call the law, sing hymns about all thine. They build themselves their dens, gather fruits, and pull herbs, marry even. But I can see through it all, see into their very souls, and see there nothing but the souls of beasts, beasts that perish, anger and the lusts to live and gratify themselves. Yet they're odd, complex, like everything else alive. There is a kind of upward striving in them, part vanity, part waste sexual emotion, part waste curiosity. It only mocks me. I have some hope of this puma. I have worked hard at her head and brain. And now, said he, standing up after a long gap of silence, during which we had each pursued our own thoughts, what do you think? Are you in fear of me still? I looked at him, and saw but a white-faced, white-haired man with calm eyes. Save for his serenity, the touch almost of beauty that resulted from his set tranquillity and his magnificent build, he might have passed muster among a hundred other comfortable old gentlemen. Then I shivered. By way of answer to his second question, I handed him a revolver with either hand. "'Keep them,' he said, and snatched at a yawn. He stood up, stared at me for a moment, and smiled. "'You have had two eventful days,' said he. "'I should advise some sleep. I'm glad it's all clear. Good night.' He thought me over for a moment, then went out by the inner door. I immediately turned the key in the outer one. I sat down again, sat for a time in a kind of stagnant mood, so weary, emotionally, mentally, and physically, that I could not think beyond the point at which he had left me. The black window stared at me like an eye. At last, with an effort, I put out the lights and got into the hammock. Very soon I was asleep. End of Part 5